Hello everyone and welcome to APS Webinars. The title of today's webinar is Teaching Agile Management, the fast-paced iterative project management style used from Amazon to NASA. I'm Crystal Bailey and I'll be your host for today's broadcast. Thank you all so much for joining us. APS Webinars are brought to you as a service of the American Physical Society, connecting you with the expertise of individuals who can offer insight into physics careers, educational programs, and professional development for students, working physicists, and educators. Today's presentation features Wouter DeConnick. Wouter will introduce Agile Management, a system that relies on quick, iterative development as opposed to more traditional top-down approaches. Used by many successful organizations, Agile Management is an empowering process allowing students to see quick results and take an active role as a member of a team. After Wouter finishes the presentation, the remainder of the program will belong to you for our question and answer session. Because of the number of people attending the webinar, we are only accepting text questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please type it into the questions panel located on the right side of the screen. You may submit questions through this panel at any time during the webinar, and we will answer all of them at the end. We'll do our best to cover all the questions you submit but we apologize if we're unable to cover everything. Finally, a link to the recording of today's presentation will be automatically emailed to you after today's event and will be made available through the webinar homepage. We do ask you to allow 24 hours for the video upload. And lastly, we encourage you to complete the survey upon exiting so that APS webinars can improve its ability to provide you with these valuable services. So with that, uh, let's get started. Um, Wouter, DeConnick is an associate professor of physics at the University of Manitoba, Canada. After receiving his MS in physics engineering at the University of Ghent in Belgium, he obtained his PhD in physics at the University of Michigan on experimental nuclear physics research at DESI uh, in Hamburg, Germany. After a postdoctoral research position at MIT at Jefferson Lab in Virginia, he became assistant professor at William & Mary where he founded a physics makerspace and engaged students in technology development and commercialization projects. In addition to precision tests of the electroweak sector of the standard model, his interests are in teaching students the skills to excel in non-academic careers and as entrepreneurs. Wouter is also a PI on the APS Pipeline Project, an NSF-funded effort to develop approaches to teaching innovation and entrepreneurship within physics. So before we get started, okay, so ha say hello, Wouter. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining the webinar today. So before we get started, we want this to be interactive and fun. Um, so we wanted to also learn a little bit about this audience's background with Agile management. So before we get started, we're gonna launch a very quick poll. Okay, and we're gonna give everybody a few seconds to, uh, to answer this, so I'll just wait a few seconds. Okay, closing the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so here are the results. So of those on the webinar today, about half, 43%, have never heard of Agile Management. Um, half of them have heard of it but not used it. And 14% uh, know it and have used it in their teaching. So that's pretty interesting. So, Wouter, uh, I guess it's over to you. Take it away. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, the introduction there and for the, the interesting poll results. I'm, I'm glad to see that there are people who are actually using Agile in teaching. And so that's what I'm going to focus on um, today is uh, I'll start off with uh, a couple of questions that sort of set the outline of the talk. So first of all, um, why should we teach students project management techniques at all, um, in particular Agile management? Um, and that will, of course, lead us into um, where do physicists find employment and what skills are, are they using in, in those uh, employment opportunities. Um, then what is agile project management? How is it different from traditional project management? Um, how does it work in a day-to-day -day setting? And then how do we teach it? Um, there's a, a one tutorial activity that I'll spend quite some time on, um, but I'll also outline how to use this in, um, in courses as, as a, an integrated part of a, a larger scope. So 
at the end of this webinar, you should be able to explain what agile management is, how it differs from uh, waterfall management. You should be able to understand how agile management can be used in projects, and you should have the, um, the tools to implement a three to four hour learning activity to introduce this to your students. So let's get started by um, looking at this uh, recent report about a, a year and a half old now from um, the JTOP um, group, the Joint Task Force on Undergraduate Physics um, uh, uh, students. So, um, sorry, my screen is cut off a bit here. Um, so, um, undergraduate physics programs. Um, so the findings of that report indicated that uh, the overwhelming majority of the physics bachelors are employed outside of academia, and also the overwhelming um, majority of, of PhD recipients find ultimately careers outside of the academic community. Uh, and there's four learning goals that this report looks at in terms of promoting career readiness. Uh, physics specific knowledge, which of course we're all very familiar with, um, scientific and technical skills, which we introduce in most of our programs as well, um, and then communication skills and workplace and professional skills. And those are the two um, that I will be focusing on in this presentation. So communication skills in workplace and professional skills, that's where uh, agile management falls in. So another source to look at is this uh, ABET survey of applied and engineering physics graduates and results from uh, an APS workshop on national issues in industrial physics. Uh, the question that was asked to industrial physicists there was what skills are physicists missing? Um, and there's a list there, I'm not going to go over all of them, um, but the ones where agile management might help is the ability to function in multidisciplinary teams, so not just physicists talking to physicists, um, leadership skills, of course, leading teams, um, familiarity with basic business concepts, including project management, and communication skills when talking to different audiences. And of course, the other aspects um, of, of the, the list here also um, come into play to a lesser extent. So now what is um, agile project management. So you may be familiar with the, the more traditional waterfall model of project management, where the requirements of the product or the thing that we are developing drive the cost and the schedule. So this is the approach that DOE, um, Department of Defense, NASA uses, and you have acronyms like WBS as work package breakdown structures, Gantt charts, uh, and typically these projects are long lead time projects, large projects where there's a lot of planning in advance um, and there's not a lot of room for changing as the project gets on its way. Um, agile management takes a different approach. Instead of letting the requirements drive cost and schedule, now we let the current available budget and the current schedule drive what features we want to implement first. Uh, so this is more frequently used by startups um, and small teams in, in organizations such as NASA um, and, and Amazon in, in the title of the talk. The reason is that there's often changes in these requirements that have to be implement, implemented in the product um, and the waterfall approach does not really allow for that very easily. So graphically, this is kind of how this looks in the waterfall approach. Um, we start off with our requirements that drives the design, that drives the implementation, and only at the very end do we do the verification that we indeed satisfy the requirements from probably three years ago by then, um, and we have a final product. The incremental delivery that we use in agile management um, takes a different approach and through many different cycles, builds slowly incremental functionality into the product. At every stage, after every iteration, there is a, a, a product that, um, that is functional um, to the extent that it has been built yet. Uh, the functionality just increases. So at any given time, we can um, pivot and steer in a slightly different direction if we wish to. A, a typical cycle, one iteration in this Agile um, cycle, uh, involves a couple of different aspects. So the main thing that everything starts from is a plan. At the beginning of an iteration cycle, we build a backlog, or we already have a backlog from, um, uh, from previous cycles, but we have a backlog of tasks, or often also called user stories, um, that have to be implemented. Um, the product owner or the PO um, is typically the customer. This is the person who essentially uh, ultimately pays for the product um, most of the time. And they're the ones who decide what is important, what has the highest priority in this backlog. So they decide what in a specific um, iteration cycle or in a sprint, as it is often called, what will have the highest priority to be implemented and what should wait until later. 
The Scrum Master or the team leader of the development team uh, then helps the team focus on those priorities that the product owner sets. And at the end of a sprint, um, we have a review where the new update with the new functionality for our product is demonstrated to the product owner. And then an important aspect is that after this review, after each sprint, there's a retrospective where the team actually reflects on uh, its performance, reflects on its, uh, um, on its I guess, uh, group dynamics. Uh, so that is an important aspect as well. Um, each day there are stand-ups, um, which are meetings uh, during which uh, the team talks about what is going on and what, uh, what people will be doing and what has been done already. Okay, so um, a typical Agile iteration cycle um, takes about one to two weeks. Um, each sprint takes about one to two weeks. Um, so it starts off with the sprint planning with the product owner or the PO. Um, then there's these daily stand-up meetings, which are really short, led by the Scrum Master, who's really just a, a team member who is taking that role as the team leader. And then at the end, we have our, our one to two hour sprint demonstration and a one hour retrospective. The product owner, as I mentioned, since they're ultimately who pays for this, um, they're the ones who decide what should be done in a sprint. The scrum master just guides the team in, in prioritization, finds the resources if necessary, finds the constraints that are happening, um, and tries to um, avoid any kind of roadblocks. And ultimately, an important aspect of, of agile management is that the team itself decides how long each task will, takes and will take um, to complete and passes that information to the product owner because ultimately the team members are the ones who do the work who are most familiar with um, uh, how long the work will take to complete. Now this is a typical agile um, iteration cycle and so you, we, talk, we call this a sprint. Sometimes people also use the word scrum to describe this process um, and we don't always follow this, uh, this process to the letter. Um, this is what is called a scrum but approach. Um, for example, in our case, uh, when we're working with students who are not full-time employees, who have complicated schedules, uh, we have to deviate from this format a little bit, but try to stay true to the, the spirit of it. All of this um, started in about 2003 with the publication of the Agile Manifesto um, in software development. And so the four core aspects of the Agile Manifesto was to focus on individuals and interactions over processes and tools, on working products, on collaboration with the customer, not on negotiating a contract way in advance, um, and on responding to change or really being agile, uh, being able to change. Um, and so this doesn't mean that there's no value on these items on the right, but there's more value um, in the items on, on the left. Um, and there's related initiatives that you may have heard of, uh, user-centered design, um, the, the lean methodology, Toyota production system, even DevOps. Um, and there's, this is to the point where you don't just have to read um, a technical uh, description of this, but you can even read um, novels about these approaches. This Phoenix project is, for example, an interesting read. So um, if we're talking about Agile, this is really a workplace culture. Um, and if we talk about cultures, there's different aspects to that. There's beliefs in a culture, there's artifacts, physical things that the people in the culture endow with meaning, and there's rituals. Uh, so in Agile, we have these aspects as well. The belief is that a, a self-organized and empowered team is more productive. Um, the artifacts that are used in Agile workplaces are Kanban boards, which I'll come back to later with post-its, um, and physical prototypes. So we're building things. We have things that we associate meaning to. Um, and then there's rituals. Uh, these for example, the simple uh, ritual of moving a task on a Kanban board is a ritual. The stand-up meetings every day are, are rituals, the demos, the retrospectives, looking back at the performance. And then there's values, iteration, collaboration, there's heroes, there's stories. Um, and that comes back to these user stories where we are putting a, a synthetic persona um, uh, where we're, we're phrasing the task around a synthetic persona who's ultimately going to interact with um, a product. So um, if we look at the uh, implementations, um, one aspect of, uh, of, of um, Agile that is often um, uh, very visual is uh, this visualization of work in, in progress. Um, so this is work in progress 
is something that has been realized since the 70s is something that uh, in, in manufacturing is, um, is something we want to avoid. We want to avoid a large amount of work in progress. We want to have things that are done or focus on one thing at a time, avoid multitasking. Um, to make that visible, uh, Agile uses these Kanban boards. Um, so this is, if you haven't seen a Kanban board, um, we have our backlog of, uh, of tasks or user stories on the, on the leftmost column. And then when we, we, when we decide in a sprint planning that we want to do something, we put it in the to-do column. Then when someone starts working on this, it goes into the ongoing or doing column. And then ultimately it's moved into the done column. So this gives a very easy overview of what um, work is actually in progress. What is ongoing at this point? What still has to be done? So it's a very visual um, aspect to this uh, uh, work in progress. Another aspect um, is uh, frequent, frequent uh, feedback on, on the progress and on performance. So this is, of course, visible in these um, daily or near daily um, uh, short stand-up meetings in the sprint aspect. So iterating with a client, with a customer, um, and then retrospection um, at the end of each sprint to uh, reflect on the, on the performance. And then finally, there's uh, continuous improvement. Um, where we understand that we're not always going to be working on the same things uh, on, on the on, um, tasks in the right way. Um, we will make mistakes, but by having iterations that are short, we make sure that um, there's an affordable loss. If we do something wrong, well, we only did it wrong for one sprint, and we realized it at the end of the sprint that this was not the right way. So we've only lost one sprint. Um, if we think back about the waterfall pro process, if we realize at the end of the process, at the end of the project, that we did something wrong, well, we've lost a, a much longer um, time period. Uh, this is not, of course, the only time that this is uh, used in, in education. Um, there's related movements to what I'm presenting here, um, Edu Scrum and Agile in Education. Um, and I think uh, those of you who have used um, Agile in uh, teaching um, and may be familiar with these initiatives. So um, all of the, the values and the beliefs and, and the benefits of Agile um, in, a, in a production environment also relate to the teaching environment. We want people to feel empowered, to reflect, to collaborate, um, and not just be productive based on, on the hierarchy or based on, uh, on, on assessments. Um, so really what we're trying to do here is build a growth mindset on top of the, the physics skill set. So at William & Mary, we've been um, experimenting with this since, uh, since 2016. So we're a liberal arts um, department, a uh, liberal arts school, um, no engineering, no medical school. Um, and uh, we have a lot of regional partners that we've worked with, in particular NASA Langley, as you'll see. Um, so we started in 2016 with a, a semester long course where we developed the Tiller Robotic Rover. So that was a course that we um, ran with an agile uh, management structure. We had three sprints each of three weeks um, in that course. Uh, we were co-supervised with a, an aerospace engineer at NASA Langley who was more familiar with these um, agile methodologies. Um, a second course we did in 2017 was a, again a semester long course. Um, in this case, we started earlier in the process and started with the idea of, um, of problem finding um, and then ideation, trying to find solutions, and then prototyping all the way into a minimum viable product. Um, again, here we were uh, fortunate to have the, the head of the incubator um, lab at, uh, at NASA Langley to be able um, to, uh, to consult with us. Um, and then the, the most recent um, Agile project that we've run is this research capstone course. Um, we did a, a year-long senior project with, um, with five students. Um, where the project was entirely outside of the expertise of the, of the advisor. So that makes it a scalable approach um, because we're not just limited to the research area of the advisor. Um, and here we used a, um, an agile consultant. Um, I'll come back to his role later. Um, and the outcome here again was a minimum viable product um, of, in this case, it was an ejectable data recorder for a NASA mission. So something that gets shot out of a um, and, and satellite upon re-entry and helps with um, offloading the data from the, the satellite. Um, in this particular case, NASA actually put the same idea out for bids or the same question out for bids using a traditional waterfall approach that so they put out the requirements, um, but they didn't get any takers. So ultimately this group of students was the only ones, were the only ones who, who had a solution to this problem by using an agile approach. And not just did they have a solution on paper, they actually had a prototype. 
Um, so in a, an implementation, um, so getting started with a project like that, we needed um, to assign some roles to the students just to get them to, to start thinking in this agile way um, and to start working together productively in a, in a team environment, working on the same project with five students together. So one of them was assigned uh, Scrum Master. We had a scribe, an archivist, um, someone who was ambassador to outside um, uh, outside partners to the project, and then a devil's advocate who always had to take the contrary view to in, to avoid that the team would uh, um, would start to engage in groupthink. Um, this is not something that is necessary in in established teams um, that know um, an agile approach, but it is something that uh, we found useful um, for small teams of students because they're very used to thinking that um, th there is a right answer and that the answer that is sort of natural or that is most in line with what they've learned to, uh, to do in a lab, um, that that is the right answer. But that's of course not the case when you're designing something entirely new. Um, so we had uh, stand-up meetings of about 15 minutes every other day at the university. We had sprint demonstrations, which lasted about an hour every three weeks, every sprint of three weeks um, on location at NASA. And then we had retrospectives and we immediately did the sprint planning after the retrospective and the the sprint demonstration sort of to, to stay in that flow. Um, we used online support tools for this Kanban board. In particular, we used Trello, um, and I can show you how this kind of looks. So we have our, our to-do list, or sprint backlog. Um, we have a, an in-progress or doing column where we limit the work in progress to one or two tasks per person. Uh, we try to get people to work on, um, on tasks in pairs. And then we have for each sprint a column um, that is done. So in this case here, you see the, the column sprint nine done, um, but we have also uh, sprints one through eight done, which are scrolled off the screen to the right. Um, in the interest of, uh, of writing stories, um, we had a specific template for tasks. So we wanted our students um, to think about the stories or, or to think about the tasks as something um, that is going to be relevant all the way through the process, um, or, or through the product. So it, it should be something that is making a difference in the end product. So it's a, it, this is something that comes out of um, user-centered design where we don't want some tasks to be done just on the back end, but we want everything to have an impact on the, on the front end or to some user of the product. Um, so that helped us um, to, to make sure that everything we were doing was valuable to um, the end user or to the product owner. We also assign weights um, to each task, one, two, three, five, eight, um, typically the number of hours. As you'll notice, that's a Fibonacci series. That's not coincidental. Um, so anything that's larger than eight, approximately eight hours, um, would have to be split up in smaller parts. And the idea of these tasks is also that um, all of the team members should be able to take um, or not all of the team member, but at least more than one person on the team should be able to complete any, any particular task. So now there's a problem here, of course. Not everyone um, at an institution can implement this year-long activity um, for, for agile uh, projects, right? So um, we needed a, a different kind of activity to familiarize students with Agile. Um, and most of the Agile tutorials that you can find online are focused on software development. So those would be no-go. Um, so what we did is uh, uh, we worked together with uh, um, BEC, Berkana Enterprise Consulting, which was the employer of our, our, our consultant that worked on this, uh, on this course, um, to develop a, a short activity with cheap materials that would allow students to experiment with this Agile management in a hardware project setting, similar to what they would do in a, in a senior design project. Um, and simultaneously, we wanted this short activity to have enough design freedom that it doesn't feel like a scripted activity. So um, this activity was developed as part of the, um, the APS pipeline network that uh, um, Crystal mentioned earlier. So I just put a screenshot here of the website. Um, and so, if you scroll down, you, you would see that there's a CubeSat materials um, link and that describes this activity um, that I'm going to talk about now, this CubeSat Scrum activity. And all of that is also um, available and the link is actually here, this GitHub link. Um, so that is all available on a GitHub page as well with all of the materials. All of this is um, a Creative Commons license so anyone can use this. 
or even modify it. So what's the activity? Um, the starting point is a CubeSat mission design. So it's, um, it's a three hour, three to four hour activity during which um, a group of students will develop a CubeSat mission. Um, that is indeed a, an ambitious and vague enough pro uh, project that it, it's sufficiently outside of the, the area of expertise of students. And that's how they would feel for a, a senior design project. Um, and what we do then is in this three hours, we speed up an agile project cycle, um, three sprints, in fact. So three sprints, each of three working days. Um, and of course, if you want to fit that all in, uh, in a three hour, uh, a three hour activity, then the working day turns out to be only 10 minutes long. So there's very quick turnaround. Um, students don't even have the chance to check their phone because whenever you're checking your phone, you're losing essentially um, a quarter of your working day. Um, it maintains all of the rituals of, uh, of agile management. It maintains the artifacts like the Kanban board. Um, it just is, it, it's all sped up um, to, a, to a very high degree. So the mission is, uh, is this. Um, there is of course global warming as we all know. Um, and there is a, um, a, the scenario is that there's a satellite um, that uh, had to be retasked and so um, the, the NASA directorate um, needs to develop a new mission that, um, that will cover that gap in, uh, in polar ice cap um, uh, studies. And so the mission must launch within four months and those four months um, indicate then of course the four sprints or the three sprints which we have to, uh, which we have to complete. Um, as part of the activity, um, the teams are given a set of um, requirements or a set of mission um, goals. So there has to be a frame to the CubeSat, there has to be solar power, um, there has to be a communication system, stabilization. Um, all of these criteria come with, uh, all of these goals come with acceptance criteria. So these all have to be implemented in these, in these three hours, in these three sprints. There's navigation, GPS, a payload camera, um, and then a remove before flight um, button so that you can, um, or, or a tag, so you can enable the satellite upon launch. Um, there's a launch vehicle that has to be selected. Uh, there's different options. Um, there's different uh, benefits to some options, disadvantages to other options. Um, there's a pre-launch checklist that indicates that you've completed all of your requirements for the mission. Um, there's power management that has to be worried about. So all of these things are at, at first, of course, seem very overwhelming to the students, much like um, what, what would happen in, um, in, a, in a research project. Um, but ultimately by focusing on the high priority items first, and by have, taking an iterative approach, the students actually complete this mission. And not only do they complete this on paper, they actually built um, the, the CubeSat. So there are templates that um, are cut out. So in this case here, you see um, a, a couple of parts of the frame. Um, there's choices that can be made. You can install an ion engine, or you can not in, decide not to install an ion engine. Um, you can have more solar cells, fewer solar cells. There's different layers um, uh, with, with power supply, batteries, GPS, payload, um, a mission computer. All of these have to be constructed out of these templates in the three hours. Uh, so this is the activity. Um, and there's different roles that people take. So as, as the instructor, uh, you would take the role of, of the NASA directorate. You make sure that the time um, schedule is respected. Um, you make sure that uh, in this case, of course, because it's an agile um, activity, you ensure that people are following the agile methodology because that's ultimately what they're trying, what you're trying to instill in the students. Um, and you ensure that, for example, um, they're not doing work during those stand-up meetings, during the retrospectives when they're supposed to be doing other activities. Um, each team has a student acting as uh, the, the scrum master um, who leads those meetings, uh, who leads the sprint planning, which in this case takes only five minutes, uh, stand-ups, which only take two minutes, demos, also five minutes, and another retrospective, which takes five minutes. So they're not acting as the team's boss, um, but they're there just to enable the team's productivity. Um, there's also an, an external um, a member of the team, the product owner, who really acts as the mission director. Um, the uh, mission director participates in the sprint planning and sets the priorities 
um, and then of course comes back when there's a demonstration um, to to see at uh, um, to see whether those priorities have indeed been implemented. Team members uh, then of course write um, tasks um, and move their cards through the Kanban columns um, and then uh, try to make sure that they complete the project. Usually we do this with multiple teams at the same time, um, which is recommended because then there's a, a, a competitive aspect of, of uh, this, this activity, which encourages uh, the participants to, be, uh, to stay on top of their game. So this is how this looks in, in time-wise. So we start with an introduction and of laying out the, the mission objectives, talking a little bit about um, Agile. Then we have our, our three sprints, and I'll go in detail about how those look, um, three sprints each of 45 minutes. And then we close out with so-called chair flying, um, which is essentially uh, the, the NASA directorate sits in the center um, and lets the team go through all of the steps of a mission from launch, through um, deployment of the, the solar panels and then a full orbit where the, the, the CubeSat flies through the, the illuminated part of the orbit and then has to demonstrate that they have enough power in the dark, um, on the dark side of the, the orbit. Um, ultimately, then we end with a, a retrospective talking about reflection of, on this, this entire um, activity and what they learned, how the, um, the, the agile, methodology help them be more productive in this uh, in this process. So this is how the sprints look. So there's three of them. They all look the same. Uh, we start with five minutes of planning and three days of each 10 minutes, um, starting with two minutes of stand-up where we the students or the team members just talk about what they're going to work on, what still needs to be done, what they completed the previous day, um, and then eight minutes of work. And then at the end of each sprint, there's a demonstration and a retrospective. So um, I'll, I'll close with some of the, the photos um, of, of uh, a recent um, uh, version of this activity. So we actually um, offered this as a workshop through the pip pipeline project at the AAPT summer meeting um, just this, this past month in, um, uh, in Utah. And uh, so this is, for example, one of those, those Kanban boards with tasks on it. Um, I think this one even includes the one task that says get paid. Um, of course, people have a lot of fun um, when, they're, uh, when they're doing this activity. Um, here you can even see that this is pretty fast paced because uh, people are getting blurred in the photos, um, especially when we get later in the process of building this uh, CubeSat, um, it, it gets pretty hectic. And in the beginning, people are still, okay, well, we can get this done. Um, but towards the end, uh, it gets very hectic. Um, and then ultimately at the end of this activity, we don't just have, as I said, uh, the um, the CubeSat on paper, but we have a, a physical CubeSat um, that is made out of paper and it has all of the components in there, has the layers of the boards in there. And as you can see, the remove before flight um, uh, tag. So coming back to my outline, um, so I hope I've, I've convinced you that uh, there's, there's a benefit to teaching project management techniques. Um, uh, another uh, anecdote here is, is that, for example, at uh, APS April meeting, there was a session on entrepreneurship um, and uh, each of the three speakers in this invited session uh, said that the main, um, the, the main thing they were looking for in new physicists and new hires was, can they get their work done on a schedule and can, are they um, aware of, of how long it will take to get something done? And so project management, of course, directly speaks to that. Um, I hope you also know now how project, Agile project management differs from waterfall project management and how Agile project management is mu much more applicable to small groups, um, even research groups, uh, student teams, and, and research teams, rather than the big project management approaches like waterfall. And then I've given you a couple of examples of how we've used Agile project management and Agile management to get things done on a variety of scales from single semester courses through um, full year research projects. Um, and then of course also the, the one activity that we can do essentially in an afternoon, which we now use as a start to uh, these, these longer um, activities. So with that, um, I'm going to close uh, my presentation and uh, I look forward to answering um, any questions you might have. Okay. 
Thank you so much, Walter. Um, yeah, so, and again, just uh, I put the link in the chat of how you can actually go to Walter, you know, th this material, the CubeSat Scrum that, that Walter has introduced. Hopefully you all see that. Also, um, that's part of a collection of other approaches that have been developed under the pipeline program. If you go to go.aps.org slash innovation, you can join our monthly newsletter where we send you the latest in, in what this group is doing. So if you're interested, uh, I would highly encourage you to join the newsletter. And then from that page, you, if you click on the pipeline network, you can see all the curricular approaches that have been developed under the grant, including Wolters. Um, but before we get to the Q&A, we also wanted to do another poll uh, and just see what impact this presentation has had on you. So I'm launching another poll. How likely are you now to implement Agile management. So we'll, again, we'll take a few seconds to uh, have you respond. Okay, get some folks voting, good. Wow, everyone's responding a lot more slowly this time. This is interesting. <laughs> it got, made you think about it, that's good. Okay, so we're going to close the poll in five, four, three, two, one. Okay, great. Well, this is excellent. So 75% uh, of you said very, very excited to try to implement Agile management. So that is fantastic. Uh, some are not sure, and a few said, you know, probably won't work for me, and that's fine. It's, um, it's a very special way of doing things. <laughs> so, uh, okay, great. Um, all right, so now let's go ahead and transition to questions. We've got a few really, really great, um, really great questions. So, first of all, um, someone asked if, have you thought about whether this content could be taught by a distance learning? What are, what do you think about that? Um, actually, I, I think this, uh, this does, um, Agile, management gets used for uh, virtual teams a lot. So that, that let me start with that. Um, so th there's certainly um, ways in which this can be adapted, I think, for, uh, for distance learning. Um, the, the one thing that um, Agile teams focus on a lot is, is having a lot of um, interaction between the team members on a frequent basis so pretty much day to day um, and so that's something that we found for example is, is putting students either in the same room or having a very active uh, virtual environment where they can talk to each other um, is, is very valuable so th there has to be this this team cohesion so we used um, slack and and uh, the students had some other platforms that they were using to talk to each other where they I guess kept uh, kept the product owners and and, and the, the managers out of them um, so I think for distance learning um, I, I think this could also benefit from this type of approach uh, in, in the same way as regular teams do because of the the empowerment and because of the self-directed nature um, of, of the learning that would happen um, but I think it would benefit also if there's if there is a strong um, social component to the interactions between the team members. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, that's great. Okay, yeah, I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, so it might be a little little tricky. Um, okay, so the next question: um, Can you say more about the PO? in the CubeSat Scrum activity? Like what, who, who would occupy that role in this, in this instance? Um, so, so for that role, we typically um, find someone who has participated in this, in this activity in the past. Um, so who knows kind of what's happening and what the goals are, um, who can take on that role. So, so it is not something that you would just pick one of the students to take on that role. Um, but for example, if uh, let's say you're organizing this activity and, and you as a faculty member want to take on the role as, as NASA directorate, as the instructor, um, one of the other faculty members may be a, a good product owner. Um, they're kind of aware of what the goals are. They know um, something about, uh, about, uh, about CubeSats. Um, they know what the priorities would be, but they're not actively involved in the activity. Um, so, 
someone who has done this before as a student might be good. Um, people who are who are familiar with uh, with project management might be good. Um, anyone who sort of has, I guess, some experience with with a larger project, um, and and who might be able to ask the right questions about prioritization, about um, what is important to get done first before we move on to other things. So one of the things that often happens, for example, um, is that uh, um, in, in the first day of the first sprint, um, you see that the team does not really focus on, um, uh, on, on the planning as much as they should. So uh, after the first or, or, or second day, um, all of the frames have been cut out. Um, and then they realize, the team realizes that uh, they have um, a two times as many frame components than they actually are going to need in the end. Um, so that means that there's been work done that shouldn't have gotten done. Um, if, if you have seen that happen once, uh, that's the kind of questions you would then ask as a PO and, and try to make sure that they don't make that mistake in the second sprint. Um, that in the second sprint, they're thinking more clearly about, well, do we have to do this? Or is this not something that we have to do right now? Um, so having a, a PO who has some experience with, with other kinds of project management, uh, with other kind of project, project management um, will lead them to ask the right questions in that direction. Yeah. Well, I, and I can tell you, uh, folks, I have done this workshop myself, you know, Wilters workshop on this twice, and, and most recently at the a AAPT summer meeting, American Association of Physics Teachers. And I can tell you that, yes, it that does happen. And if it happens once, you're very careful not to let it happen again. And so, yeah, that it's, it's again, the iterative aspect of it is, is, is very, very instructive. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. It is pretty annoying when you realize that you've cut out a bunch of stuff or created some components that you don't actually need because there wasn't the right proper planning. So <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, so, okay. Um, another question. Um, so some folks want to hear a little bit more about how you actually have designed ways to implement agile management in a, in a longer sort of semester long design course. And I think another related question to that is, you know, are there, can you suggest any other kind of physics related topics or concepts that might also be a good fit for teaching this uh, on a longer time scale? Hmm. Um, so, I think, um, so obviously this is not necessarily something that works for every project, right? Um, it is something that works for teams. Um, it is something that works where, when you can have um, the members of, a, of the team work pretty much interchangeably on, on aspects of the, of the problem. Um, so it, it, there are indeed places where this would maybe not work as well. For example, um, if, um, if you have a very high specialization in um, in the types of of things that need to get done, I'm just thinking about a, a, a typical research group might have um, a very might have different students, undergraduate students or graduate research students um, working on very specific and different things, so they can't easily take up tasks from uh, uh, take over tasks from each other or share tasks in that way. Um, so that might be a little bit more difficult to implement it there. So in, in trying to implement this on a semester long um, uh, course, it may make sense to think about um, the kind of uh, projects where you have multiple students working on things at the same time with the same level of expertise. And actually this means that typically for undergraduate projects, this will work better because we don't have the level of specialization in undergraduate students yet um, that, we, that we see in graduate students. Um, so in, in, for example, um, a, a different context, um, it might be having a team of students uh, come up with a different, a, a new type of lab equipment um, that would be used in either a teaching lab or in a demonstration um, environment. Uh, so that could be, for example, something that you could put, let's say, three to five students on, um, have them work on that in an agile way where every two weeks, every three weeks, they come up with a different, with a new iteration of the, the lab demo equipment or the teaching lab equipment that you want them to develop. And they all have the necessary skills to be able to, uh, to work um, together on that, uh, on that project. 
so so those are the kind of projects that I would be looking for. Um, so in our case, um, the, the projects kind of came through uh, our connection with NASA Langley. Um, I would certainly also take advantage of the, the, the local resources that are there um, in, in any location that you might be at. There, there are companies that are probably struggling with questions that they're not necessarily looking to put their employees on, but they would still like to have an answer to it. Um, and it may not always be 400 level physics, but it may be 200 or 300 level physics. Um, it may not be quantum mechanics, but it will definitely involve some mechanics and maybe some fluid mechanics. Um, it may be getting in the direction of engineering, but it will be physics engineering. So those are the kind of projects that I would, I would be looking for. Um, the other aspect would be that um, we had a lot of benefit uh, from working together with an agile consultant. Um, and that is also maybe not something that everyone, um, you know, not everyone has an agile consultant on speed dial, um, I imagine. But I found that the community of agile practitioners are very happy to teach and to work together with, uh, with young people, with students. Um, because they know, I mean, they're very motivated in, in agile management. And then you, you hear that probably from me too. Um, I, I, you know, I think this is a great method. I want to tell people about it. Um, they find this a great method. They want to tell people about it. They want to teach groups of, of five, two groups of five students um, over a semester by, for example, calling into um, uh, to stand up meetings or calling into sprint planning meetings. So they want to help with that and they, they can help with that. And it doesn't necessarily need to be in their direct area of expertise. I mean, our agile consultant uh, was an agile consultant for a, a, a mobile app developer. Uh, it wasn't an agile consultant for, for NASA. Uh, it, the, the project management aspect is pretty separate from the technical problems that the team is working on. So I would also look um, in, in in your local area for, for those connections with Agile consultants. Um, and, and most bigger metropolitan areas have, um, have Agile meetups where people exchange ideas about Agile management. Um, and, and that might be a good source uh, to connect to at first um, to find those people who would be interested in being a, um, a, a, uh, an Agile consultant for, for an educational project like that. Cool. Um, yeah, and on a related, Topic. I, I'm kind of curious, uh, again, try to be a little bit interactive. So of those who did respond, like, yeah, this sounds like something I would love to try. Can you type in the questions box a little bit about what context you're thinking you might use this approach? Let's see if anybody's willing to say anything. Hmm. Might be typing. Um, and while I'm waiting to hear from some folks, uh, I'm curious, Wotar, how many times did you actually have to teach this, like using this approach before you felt like you had total facility with this? Um, so in, in, in the longer term projects, like the, the, the semester long courses or the year long courses, it, it probably came together after the, the second second time. And then the third time I, I kind of felt that, that everything went well. Um, the, the activity, the, um, the CubeSat Scrum activity, they're probably something similar. So the, the third time I did that, of course, they were, they were much quicker in, in, in much quicker succession. The third time it probably felt, felt like it was it, I felt happy about the workshop at the end. Um, the first two times, you know, was maybe a little bit chaotic. Uh, the, the second time, it might have been better than the first time, but the third time, that's when when I felt like things went well. And I think that's also somewhat, I mean, maybe there's something special about this number three. That's why we have three sprints. We've tried this this workshop in a, in a, in a shortened format with only two sprints. And it's, it's not quite the same. After the second sprint, you, you get some of the learning. You see that the second sprint goes better than the first sprint, but it's really the third sprint when, you when you've 
at, at the end of the second sprint, you've realized that the second sprint was so much better than the, than the first sprint. And then you intentionally say, now let's, let's do even better in the third sprint. And, and lo and behold, it, it does go better in the third sprint. And, and that's, that's really empowering, I think, to the participants in this workshop. And, and that's the same thing you feel when you're implementing this uh, in, in teaching uh, and in, in project and technology development courses with students. Right on. Well, yeah, and in fact, I've gotten a couple nice um, responses from the audience uh, that, that someone said that they're teaching an intro to college class for freshman physics and engineering majors. Often kind of ends up being a some Arduino project. Of course, we, we do under Pipeline have somebody who developed an Arduino project. That's very cool. <laughs> but uh, he's saying that um, this would be a nice kind of thing to incorporate or maybe do instead uh, to teach them these really valuable professional skills. And I couldn't agree more, um, but that's very cool. Another um, um, example, sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, please, um, another please. example would be um, a, uh, um, a computational physics course, which, which often um, is, is offered at the, at the maybe 200, 300 level. Um, and where students are often asked to complete projects, right? Uh, there, there's a project once, once a, a month, maybe three times during the semester, or there's a final project at the end of the semester. Um, why not think about doing that in group? Um, having, let's say, a group of, of or a team of, of three, four students work on a project like that. Um, and one of the advantages that Agile through its iterations offers is that you force the work to get done earlier as well. They can't wait until the last the last minute to complete the group project because at, at any given time th there has to be work in the pipeline there's work in progress maybe there, there's only one task in progress at any given time but it starts earlier and so it's much better spread out over the semester and if you do that with a, a, a task tracking board like Trello you actually can check in on them you can see how much work is getting done early in the semester and if you see that not much work is getting done then you can you can let the students, the team know that, you know, they're going to have to work a little bit harder in the next sprint. Um, so something like that, where you have a, a sprint, let's say maybe every two weeks, you require that students hand in some, some preliminary work. That could work with, with the computational physics course. It could, could work maybe with the, um, the Arduino projects as well, um, if they're developing something. So let's say after sprint one, they have to have a, an electronic design ready. After sprint two, they have to have um, an idea of what their their bill of materials is going to be, and then sprint three is going to be the actual um, ordering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and also there was a, a comment made um, about uh, like, is there any sort of video demonstration of of basically the CubeSat Scrum because it's hard to visualize uh, kind of <laughs> how it would go. And I and again, it's it's I've done two iterations. One one was even like basically half, the amount of time was compressed by half and it was crazy. And then the second time it was closer to the normal three to four hours, but still it was compressed. And, and um, so it's, it's pretty nuts. And, you know, we, we did not video the, the, the session at AAPT, which I regret. I mean, it was, it was very hard to kind of think about how we would video that so that it was clear what was going on. Um, and Wotar, you, you can, if you have any suggestions about resources, that's great. I will also say, though, that um, we we may do this workshop again. It may be part of a APT or another conference. And so whenever possible, I would encourage you to attend um, and, and, and do this yourself. And we would, of course, be advertising any such opportunity through the Pi newsletter. So please go to go.aps.org slash innovation and sign up for the newsletter. Um, do you have any, Woder, do you have any knowledge of a video or something that people could reference um no i don't think i've never been at um i've never organized one of these where we videotaped it and i i don't know of anyone else who has um in in, in bec who has uh, videotaped them um the bec has has consultants that are fairly spread out mainly on the east coast um and and so I, I think there may be ways that, you know, there, there may be someone who has participated in a workshop, like in, in this workshop, it may be someone closer than you think. Um, so certainly 
do feel free to reach out to me um, and, and I can try to, to see whether I know someone in, in, in your geographic area. Um, the other thing we've done is, is kind of do a little bit of coaching. Like I, I, I could offer to, um, to have a, a phone call and, and sort of talk through some of the, the, the general things that, that you might expect um, beyond what I've talked about now. Um, and you might have more questions, so I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Um, it, it, it sometimes depends a little bit on the local um, the local situation. Uh, so depending on, on what, yeah, it, it, it's difficult to say, but um, we might we might just have to uh, to videotape the four, four hours of a, an entire workshop and then uh, then cut out the, the the good parts and put them together in a in a ten minute video or something. Yeah, I think that would really help a lot of folks um, because, again, I'm sure many folks here are probably thinking, this is great, but I, you know, wow, how would I, how would I do it myself? So, um, so, so I would maybe, be maybe I'll add one thing, though. Um, this is maybe a, um, a, a problem not as much with the, with the format of, of these, these tutorials, but it's more of a problem with how we propagate this kind of information. Um, so uh, Crystal knows about the, the Venture Well Open Conference, and that conference is set up around workshops and tutorials. And APS just doesn't have the the history or tradition of offering workshops this way. Um, I, I find that the, at, at the Venture Well Open Conference, for example, you would pick up these workshops and you would be able to attend them and and see how they're being done and then take that to your home institution to a much greater degree than, um, than APS. And, and AP, AAPT is getting to the point of, of those workshops through, for example, that summer workshop we've done um, in, uh, in Utah. Um, and, and there's many other workshops that are offered there in a similar spirit. So it's really by participating in those workshops when they're being offered somewhere that you, um, you become familiar with how to, how to run something like that. Uh, yeah. I don't know if, if you wanna comment on that, Crystal. I mean, yeah, I, I put a link to VentureWell's uh, website. They're a tremendous resource. They're an organization that works to promote innovation and entrepreneurship education across STEM fields and then even out into the arts and humanities. Uh, many of the pipeline cohort and other physicists have gone to their conferences um, and they're a tr wonderful opportunity to take these workshops and learn about these approaches. So I highly recommend if you wanna learn more, please visit their website, VentureWell.org. They've got other great, like entrepreneurship team competitions for students that are really fun. Uh, a great opportunity for students to learn this stuff firsthand and they give at all participants really excellent support. Um, so there are a couple questions left and I'm sorry we did not get to them. Um, I can forward these for comments, um, but this is really all the time that we have for our official webinar today. So I apologize for those who have not uh, gotten their questions answered. Um, so yeah. We, I will definitely follow up by email um, and I can share some of these questions with Walter. Um, as I already said, both a recording of the video and slides for this presentation will be made available on the webinar homepage and also on that link I sent above. Um, it's basically go.aps.org slash innovation and then click on the pipeline network and click on Walter's CubeSat um, activity and you will find a video for that and the slides from the presentation. Um, you'll also be emailed, you'll get an email from the system, the GoToWebinar system, with a link to this recording. So we just out, uh, last, ask that you allow 24 hours for us to get that together. And lastly, to help us continue to develop quality webinars, please take a moment when you leave, there's gonna be a very short survey. Um, we really would appreciate your quick feedback on today's presentation. So this wraps up today's event, and we hope you will join us again next time. American Physical Society, copyright 2019, all rights reserved.